So that's why you like the song. Oh, well, I like the song because of the song. I mean, I guess I also like it. It's got a story behind it. You know, Bill Danoff later said that he ain't never even been to West Virginia. Okay, so let's talk about John Denver for a second. John Denver's life and legacy is a little bit murky, which is a pretty nice way of putting it, actually. He was an absolute legend in country music, and music as a whole is one of my personal favorites. He's a favorite of my family and a lot of my friends' families. He was an avid environmentalist and a huge philanthropist. He was also pretty honest, or at least willing, to talk about his drinking, his drug use, and his domestic violence in interviews and in his autobiography, which was published a few years before his death in an airplane accident. Denver's legacy, especially in country music and music at large, is that he was held in pretty high regard. He released 30 studio albums, had 11 number one hit singles, and had a number of songs go gold or platinum in the 70s, which is when he was producing most of his recognizable music. And in 1985, he was awarded the NASA Exploration Public Service Medal for helping to increase awareness of space exploration by the peoples of the world. Because he loved flying, which is how he ended up in the plane accident that killed him in the first place, and he was dedicated to America's interest in space, so he was really involved in NASA. At least as much as you probably can be as a civilian. In fact, he was a finalist for NASA's 1986 mission to have the first citizen in space, which ended up resulting in the Challenger disaster. He had every intention, if he had actually won, instead of just being a finalist, to write a song in space. And then after the disaster happened, he ended up dedicating Flying For Me to all of those killed in the explosion. And then nearly 20 years after his death in 1997, the film industry was flooded with movies that featured John Denver's music. Jessica Rodden over at Cinema Blend noted in her piece from October of 2017, why John Denver's music is in so many movies this year, that this was largely due to Brian L. Schwartz and Amy Abrams being hired by Denver's children in 2010 to manage their father's estate. It was basically a long waiting game as they waited for the bubble to pop, and 2017 was that year. The bubble popped. Annie's song was featured in Free Fire and Okja, and then Take Me Home Country Roads, which is probably his most famous song to people who don't listen to country music or John Denver at large, appeared in no less than four films that year in some way. It was in Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, Alien Covenant, Kingsman The Golden Circle, and the film we're talking about today, Logan Lucky. Let's talk about Steven Soderbergh. Born in Georgia and raised in Virginia and Louisiana, Steven Soderbergh was one of those dudes who had been making films since he was young on Super 8 and 16 millimeter cameras. In 1980, he submitted his directorial debut, Lie, Sex, and Videotapes, to Cannes, and it won a bunch of awards, including the Palme d'Or, which is the highest award at the festival. At 26, he was the second youngest director to win the award up to that point. Like, Roger Ebert called him the poster boy for the Sundance generation. And in 2006, Lie, Sex, and Videotapes was entered into the Library of Congress as an important piece of film history and general culture at large. However, after Lie, Sex, and Videotapes, his next string of films were mildly received at best. In 1998, almost 10 years after Lie, Sex, and Videotapes came out, he did a stylized adaptation of Elmore Leonard's Out of Sight, which starred George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez. And this film brought him back into, at the very least, the critical fold. This was also the beginning of Soderbergh and George Clooney's long and healthy working relationship. He then went on to direct Aaron Brockovich and Traffic in the same year, both of which received critical and commercial success. So with all of that success, Soderbergh was tapped to direct a remake of the classic Rat Pack film Ocean's Eleven, which he stylized with the word. Boy, did that movie hit it out of the park. It starred George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Don Cheadle, Bernie Mac, and Julia Roberts. And the first Ocean's film was made on an $85 million budget because Soderbergh somehow convinced all of these A-list actors to take back-end deals instead of upfront salary. And that film ended up making over $450 million worldwide. So like, you nailed it. The series spawned two sequels and a spinoff, all of which have gone off like gangbusters, however, to a slightly lesser scale than the original. He then went on to direct The Girlfriend Experience, which was adapted into an anthology TV series, the first season of which starred Riley Keough, Contagion, which popped off again during the beginning of the pandemic. 
excellent. And Magic Mike, which was a semi-autobiographical film about Channing Tatum's life as a young male stripper in Florida. And just as a fun note, this movie also has Riley Keough in it. So Soderbergh's career is filled with stories about working class people trying to do right by themselves, their families, and their friends. Even I would argue that the Oceans movies, though they might seem upper class and glitzy, and certainly are to some degree, are actually about people who are living in not necessarily like abject poverty, but are trying to make their lives better. And they are not at the level where they can just buy their lives being better. And I think the line between Steven Soderbergh working with Channing Tatum on a movie like Magic Mike, which is very much about being a Southern working class person trying to make a go of it in a very specific way, to Logan Lucky, which also stars Channing Tatum as a Southern working class person trying to make a go of it in a very specific way, is a pretty straight line. Especially when you consider that Steven Soderbergh only made one film between Magic Mike and Logan Lucky. Logan Lucky was the first film that he made after a four year hiatus, which is wild. And now with that, let's talk about Logan Lucky. So Logan Lucky is a 2017 heist film that was written by Rebecca Blunt and directed by Steven Soderbergh. And it is not unlike in its construction, the other Oceans films that Steven Soderbergh had directed. This particular film stars Channing Tatum as Jimmy Logan, Adam Driver as his younger brother Clyde, and Riley Keough as their younger sister Millie. It also has Katie Holmes as his ex-wife, Bobby Joe, and introducing Daniel Craig as Joe Bang. The film is set in motion because Jimmy loses his job at the beginning of the movie and he is fed up of him and his family seemingly always losing. And so he decides to rob the NASCAR Speedway he was working at and uh, yeah, it's time for a hillbilly heist. But I think that for the purposes of this video and me talking about the things that I think really work in this video and why I think I love it so much, we need to get pretty granular because all of the small strokes of this film are the things that make it really work for me on a visceral level. So that being said, this next section is all spoilers, just all fucking spoilers. We open on Jimmy and his daughter, Sadie, working on fixing his truck. He's telling her the story behind John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads because he's trying to convince her to sing it at her pageant. We also get some light information about his general cell phone use, which becomes important later. Then we see Jimmy at work under the Charlotte Motor Speedway doing construction. They're trying to fill in a bunch of sinkholes because of where the Charlotte Motor Speedway is built. And so he's on the crew who's doing that. He gets laid off though, because he has a limp from an old sports injury and his higher up bosses saw him one day and are letting him go because- it's liability issue. After that, we meet his sister, Millie, who works as a hairdresser. And Jimmy tells his sister that he got off early, lying about getting fired and wants to take his daughter to her rehearsal for the pageant. Except uh, actually it was yesterday and he missed it. So then he goes to apologize to his ex-wife, Bobby Joe, and her husband, Mooney, for not taking his daughter to the rehearsal. Sadie has finally decided on a song for the pageant. She wants to sing Umbrella by Rihanna, which is fun because of Ocean's 8, even though that came after. What song? Umbrella by Rihanna. When Rihanna sings Umbrella, she's not really singing about a rain umbrella. She's really singing about her vagina. It's code. Who told you that? And Bobby Joe tells him that Mooney is opening a new car lot because he, his family owns car lots and they're moving out of state. Not too far out of state, but they're moving out of state. Annoyed at the new circumstances of his life, Jimmy heads over to Duct Tape, which is the bar where his little brother Clyde works. Clyde is obsessed with the Logan family curse. We get our first look at NASCAR on the TV before Max Chilblame barrels into the bar with a few of his lackeys. He is complaining about his driver, Dayton White. He owns a shitty but profitable energy drink and is fully sponsoring White's return to NASCAR. This comes up later. He starts some shit with Clyde about his missing arm, which he had blown off during one of his tours in Iraq, which Jimmy gets involved in by slamming Max's head against the bar. And then Clyde goes and sets fire to their car outside. The next day, Jimmy cooks Clyde breakfast and goes over the plan. They're robbing the Charlotte Motor Speedway. He has a diorama, a list of 10 rules for robbing a bank fault and a full last plan based on what he knows about working construction under the speedway. Enter Joe Bang. The boys go and visit him in prison. He has them buy him a set of hard boiled eggs from the vending machine, which is utterly deranged. And he uses this salt substitute on it, which comes back later. So they propose to him the job, which includes breaking him out for the set amount of time in broad daylight that they would need to complete the job. Joe Bang agrees, but only if his brothers are involved. So everybody goes to the Easter fair and Mooney tries to convince Millie that his car is better than hers in the parking lot, that she should let him outfit her with a new car. And she makes a crack about him not being able to drive stick, 
before everybody heads into the fair. It's very funny. I love it a lot. It's setting up a whole vibe between them. Jimmy and Clyde meet up with Joe's brothers, Sam and Fish. We're living with the lower now meaning they need a good reason to break the law these days. The Logans presumably lie and tell them that the Grocery Castle Auto, who are putting on the event of the day of the heist, harassed Millie when she got a job there. Unclear if any of that is true, probably not. And they agree to help with the heist. Then they go and visit their brother Joe in prison, who tells them to visit the bear in the woods, which ends up just being a random dude in a bear suit who gives them a bag that has explosives sort of in it that Joe gave him. It never comes back and it is probably my favorite thing in this entire movie. It's so weird and wonderful. The next part of the plan is to have Clyde go to the same prison as Joe. So he crashes into the side of a gas station and gets sentenced to prison for 90 days. Millie does some reconnaissance so Joe and Clyde can start building the means of their escape the day of the heist. Jimmy spray tans his daughter at an auto shop before they go to visit Millie to get her hair done for the pageant. While he's waiting for Millie to finish his daughter's hair, he meets Sylvia, who works as a nurse in a medical RV driving around West Virginia, giving tetanus shots and other medical care to people who can't make it out of their homes. She gives him a free tetanus shot. He realizes that they went to high school together, but he doesn't really remember her, but he probably probably maybe kissed her in high school. It's very cute. Back at home, Millie works at her plane to figure out which of the tubes under the speedway go into the actual money vault by painting cockroaches. The Bang brothers buy stuff at a home improvement store and Jimmy goes to the construction site to grab the last of his stuff and steal a map, except he runs into his old boss and finds out that construction is wrapping up before the date that they're planning on robbing the speedway using the construction stuff. So they end up having to move their heist up by a week, which means it goes from being on the slowest day of the year to Coca-Cola 600 is the biggest race of the year. That's a big difference. Shit happens. They call the baker to make a cake for Gleema who works in the vault at the Speedway. She brings the cake into the vault for everybody to eat and gets called out because her car gets hit in the parking lot. All of this is constructed, but because of the timing of this, the vault locks at 5.30 on the dot. She doesn't make it back in and the cake gets left in the vault. The Bang Brothers let loose Millie's painted cockroaches so they can figure out the next day when they go in posing as the exterminators, which tubes actually went to the vault based on which cockroaches made it into the vault. Meanwhile, at the prison, Joe Bang propositions Neiman, who's a black prisoner, to help him on the day of the heist. I would presume that whatever Joe Bang talks to him about gets spread out based on what happens, but I have no confirmation of that. And then we make it to the day of the race and heist in question. Joe Bang drinks some water out of one of the sinks, which he's not supposed to do, which causes him to puke at lunch in front of the warden. He gets sent to the infirmary. Mooney proclaims to Millie outside while they're getting ready to go to Sadie's pageant that he took a stick shift car from the lot, which when Millie leaves to go actually start the heist. She can't help herself, but she, uh, she steals it. She certainly does. She's, she steals it. I love her. Back at the prison, Joe tells the nurse he needs to pee, but she doesn't want him to get lightheaded and pass out. Clyde is working in the infirmary though and offers to take Joe because he's fighting the nurse on using the bedpan. This is because they're going to escape through the bathroom. They get up under the truck that comes to the prison every day, the one that Millie had scoped out that they were building the undercarriage for. So they use the undercarriage to make it out of the prison. And then Naaman and a few other prisoners start a fake fight, which leads to a fake riot. And the warden is so focused on not calling it a riot because- We don't have riots at Monroe. That they're able to keep it going for a while and kind of list demands. They end up covering up all of the windows so nobody can see inside. There are a couple of guards in the cafeteria with them that they just tie up to chairs. And uh, yeah, it's actually very funny. <laughs> it leads to a really great sequence where they're arguing about Game of Thrones. The only problem is that uh, the winds of winter and the dream of spring have yet to be published. So those aren't available. No. Well, I can't do anything about what I can't control. That is total bullshit. George R. R. Martin was supposed to deliver the Winds of Winter to his publisher over two years ago. The Bang Brothers make the liquid bomb out of the stuff that they picked up from the bear in the woods that Joe had left for them. And they blow up the internet outpost at the speedway, making all of the card readers go down. So they have to start flushing cash into the bank vault. Meanwhile, Joe and Clyde get out from under the truck at the gas station where Millie picks them up. And here is where we meet Dayton White. 
played by Sebastian Stan, who is returning after a long break from NASCAR. He is very clearly in dispute with Max, who owns To The Max, which is the drink that is fully sponsoring his return to NASCAR, and he is forced to drink a bunch of it before the race, despite very clearly not wanting to. Once everybody is at the track, Joe goes to buy some beer and some gummy bears. Him and Clyde get down into the service way by going down a trash chute before meeting up with Jimmy in the service construction tunnels. With two bleach pens, a plastic bag, his fake salt, and the gummy bears, Joe Bang makes a bomb. I'm, I'm sorry an explosive device because science, which does fail at first uh, in a very stressful way, but then it works pretty spectacularly. However, the bang causes smoke, which goes up through the tubes into concessions, which does get called in by someone working at concessions. A few security guards are dispatched to find the source down in the tunnels. Meanwhile, the team starts to collect money from the vault using one of the machines to suck, literally just like suck stuff through the tube. It's very funny. They mess up though, speeding it up because they're getting a little greedy. And when Jimmy pops the machine in reverse, it ends up sucking Clyde's prosthetic arm in to the machine. The Bang Brothers and the Logan Brothers all get into multiple fights about various things, from the built-up resentment between Jimmy and Clyde to Sam and Fish getting mad at them because they changed the date. And then Jimmy yells at them to get everybody back on track, and he promises Clyde he'll get his arm out of the machine as long as they keep going with the plan. Meanwhile, Dayton's sugar levels actually drop because of the energy drink that he drank, and he crashes his car. The Bang Brothers take one of the loads of trash bags filled with money out, but they do get stopped by the security guards. They're able to get past them, but they're still kind of suspicious and they end up going back the way the Bang Brothers came. The security guards come across a room that has smoke coming out of it where an engineer, who's actually the mechanic from the spray tan scene, is smoking on one of his brakes and they assume that this is the cause of the smoke going up into concessions. However, the Bang Brothers do get stuck at one of the gates, which just like won't open for them. They haven't come back yet and Jimmy suggests Joe go find them since he is their older brother after all. He does find them and he also can't get the gate open. Jimmy goes and eventually finds all of them before they end up trying to take the fucking gate off the tracks and he fixes it because it was a very simple fix. Joe and Clyde have to get back to the prison and so they end up running into Dayton and Max in the tunnels who are having a fight about Dayton's crash and Max's shitty energy drink and Max recognizes Clyde from the fight at the bar. Meanwhile, back at the prison, the guys in the cafeteria light a trash can on fire to set off the fire alarms so that the fire department will come to the prison and Joe and Clyde can sneak back in that way which was always their plan. Millie then makes it back to the pageant a little late, but in time to give Sadie the finishing touches before she goes on to sing Umbrella. As Sadie goes up, however, she sees her dad, Jimmy, in the back of the audience and decides to sing John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads in tribute to him, which everyone joins in and sings with her. Rolling like a breeze, country roads, take me home. I, I love it so much. It's very sweet. I cry every time. Thank you. Sadie wins the pageant and then Jimmy drops his truck full of trash bags of money at a gas station a few towns over. He hitches a ride back to his place before he burns the last remnants of the plan in the bonfire outside. A few days later, he calls in the truck, which is linked back to the Charlotte Motor Speedway heist because obviously they came in and saw the money missing. And Sarah Grayson from the FBI is called in to investigate. And in classic Steven Soderbergh fashion, we get the rundown of what actually happened and how Jimmy and company actually pulled everything off because of the investigation. She goes through all of the locations from the vault all the way to the prison, but everybody kind of fucked up in their own ways that day and all of them have a vested interest in keeping that fuck up as close to the chest as possible. Like for example, Max calls in as an eyewitness because he saw Clyde in the tunnel when he was having his fight with Dayton. And so Sarah and her partner go to question him. However, Dayton doesn't corroborate any of Max's story about seeing Clyde in the tunnels or being attacked. She goes to the prison to question the warden who stands his ground about nothing bad happening the day of the robbery, even though there was a fire. And then Clyde gets out of prison, presumably 90 days later. Neither he nor Millie has spoken to Jimmy since the heist and Clyde moves in with Millie. She's gone to collect his stuff, including a piece of mail that is a new 
robot prosthetic arm, presumably from Jimmy. And then Joe gets out of prison. He goes to see Clyde at duct tape and he is still very angry that Jimmy gave back all the money. Clyde has no answers for him though because he hasn't talked to his brother in three months. And then six months has passed since the heist and the investigation is closed by the Speedway. Cue a montage of all the people they wronged to complete the heist getting done right by them. And the truth of how they did everything and what they actually did set to Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son. It is truly iconic. Joe wakes up one day to a knock and a shovel on his porch. His portion of the money is buried where he had originally hidden his stash before he went to prison. Naaman gets out of prison and is treated to a limo, champagne, and an envelope filled with cash. Likewise, Sylvia and the mobile clinic get an envelope filled with cash, written in crown and sealed the same band-aids that she put on Jimmy after his tetanus shot. Gleema gets another cake in her car that she actually gets to finish this time. And then Jimmy comes to pick up his daughter at Bobby Joe's new house. He's working at Lowe's and while it's only seasonal, he does hope that they keep him on. He finds out that his daughter doesn't care about pageants suddenly and instead is extremely into cooking. It's so cute. And for the final scene, everybody is back together at duct tape. Jimmy explains to Clyde why he knew it was finally time to collect the money. You know that phone company gave you about 60 days to pay that phone bill? Yeah. Well, you got one day over and they shut your phone off. So? Mm -hmm. I ain't paid the bill out of the trailer in like six months. So? I figured as long as they was tapping my phone, they keep it on. About a week ago, it finally went dead. Sylvia meets up with him at the bar. They're together now. It's very cute. Joe and Millie are flirting on the other end of the bar and Clyde talks to a mysterious woman on the opposite end of the bar because it's a circular oval shaped bar. It's Sarah, our FBI investigator. We track from her smiling to Clyde's old arm holding a beer on a table. Everybody is out of focus and of movie. So by all accounts, Steven Soderbergh seemed like he was done making films after Magic Mike, at least as a director. He was really vibing and happy to work on television like The Nick and didn't see himself going back to films anytime soon. And then Rebecca Blunt's script came across his desk through his wife, Jules Asner. And this seems like a good time to get into this very weird, mysterious element of Logan Lucky. Who the fuck is Rebecca Blunt? The short answer is that she's probably probably no one. Like, she doesn't exist. The follow-up to that, however, is five years later, we still don't actually know whose pseudonym it was. According to the production notes, which I will link down below, Rebecca Blunt was a first-time screenwriter and friend of Soderbergh and his wife, Jules Asner. And the only people who have ever, I think, directly said that Blunt is a real person, for real, guys, is Steven Soderbergh and Adam Driver, oddly enough. So in 2017, as the film was coming out, Tatiana Siegel at The Hollywood Reporter also noticed this, that like, who is this person? And did a really good write-up about this mystery that nobody else had really noticed, that Rebecca Blunt didn't seem to actually be a real person. She cited sources that speculated that maybe Jules Asner, his wife, was the actual writer, that maybe it was very oddly enough e-personality John Henson, who was a friend of Soderbergh and had worked on a few projects with him in the past, or just as likely as anything else, Rebecca Blunt was one of the pseudonyms that Soderbergh had created for himself. He's been known to do before. He works under the false names of Peter Andrews and Mary Ann Bernard for his cinematography and his editing respectively. In fact, he literally used both of those pseudonyms on Logan Lucky. It's pseudonym city over here, okay? However, I personally just think it's more likely that Jules Asner is Rebecca Blunt, that this is her pseudonym for screenwriting, and that we can take the grain of salt of her not wanting it to come across like Soderbergh was just making his wife's movie as a valid thing because yeah, the work is good. You don't want it to get overshadowed by something so petty and mundane. A source close to the production has confirmed as much, but nobody actually involved has come out and said anything on record. So I guess it's still kind of up in the air, but like what a weird thing to like put into the film, especially because it's like not actually, like they didn't use it as like marketing or anything. It, well, maybe they did, I don't know. Maybe that was the ploy all along, but it's just odd. So outside of that mystery, which has plagued me for five years and I just think it's so interesting and weird, I 
just really want to talk about this film and kind of the broad strokes of why I think it works and why I think it works for me personally. So I'm from Western North Carolina. This film is primarily set in West Virginia and in Charlotte, obviously, because of the Charlotte Motor Speedway. But, you know, where they are in West Virginia is also very similar to where I grew up. It's all Appalachia and, you know, it's a curved fun line. If you watched my Bo Burnham video, you'll know that I moved around a lot as a kid, but I did spend the majority of my life, especially a lot of my formative years, in North Carolina in Appalachia. So while absolutely no one is doing the same accent, and like some of them are pretty good in terms of like regionally specific, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> like it, oh, I know it should. It bothered my best friend Megan when I made her watch it, but like I have known people who sound like every person in this movie. Whether that's correct or not, I don't think maybe matters all that much. Like even Joe Bang, who is probably doing like the most cartoonish version of like a Southern Appalachian specific accent, still sounds like people I've known in my life. I don't know, there's something very comforting about any and all of these weird accents everyone is doing. I love them, it's great. But mainly I think that this film works because a lesser film made by less empathetic people wouldn't be so non-judgmental about Southern, particularly Appalachian culture. I think it would be much more of a like, haha, look at the hicks kind of slant, but the only people who actually behave like that in the film are outsiders of the community who are assholes like Max. I can imagine a different film made by different people where even our lead might make jokes or a series of jokes, a running gag if you will, about how their culture is actually ridiculous and they can't believe that they were born into it, etc. But Jimmy's not like that. These are his people and he's here to protect them. Like Channing Tatum is Southern and while he's not Appalachian Southern, it's very clear that Jimmy Logan is not an avatar for a West Coast Hollywood actor to make fun of a not insignificant population of the country. Instead, Channing Tatum is doing like work and it rules. Like, I love this character. Like, instead of making fun of the cultural knowledge, that character uses his cultural knowledge to lead him and his crew to success. It's such a rare Hollywood affirmation that country doesn't mean dumb or brutal. As a side note, I did write about Southern identity for Movie John a couple months back, and I will link it down below. I looked at another 2017 film, actually, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, which is a film that was shot an hour outside of my hometown, in the town that I went to college in, Silva, North Carolina. And it's also the place where they shot chunks of deliverance, particular chunks of deliverance, which I talk about in the piece, because I wanted to talk about the things that have changed in the portrayal of Southern identity over the last 40 plus years that exists between those films. And the answer is that like, not a lot has, unfortunately. But I think that Logan Lucky makes a good case for more empathetic, interesting Southern storytelling, especially set in Appalachia. And I marvel at the fact that this film and Three Billboards came out in the same year because wow, do they tackle an understanding of Southern identity so differently. But the crew in Logan Lucky wins because they're smart. Like, that's the whole fighting the stereotype while existing in the culture thing that I think works so well. That they know what they're up against and understand the culture that they're trying to get into because they already exist in it. It's why I think actually the Oceans films work so well because Danny and company might not be part of the society they're robbing in like a monetary way, you know? But they understand how that culture operates and behaves when put to certain tests, which they either stress or avoid and that knowledge is what makes their plans work every time. And having that knowledge to kind of pivot when shit happens is also important to why they succeed. And it's important to why the Logan Lucky crew succeeds. About Logan Lucky, Soderbergh said this, which I really love. It's kind of a cousin to the Oceans films, but it's also an inversion of those movies because these characters have no money and no technology. They live in very pressured economic circumstances, so a couple of garbage bags full of cash can turn their lives around. Which I think really gets to the empathetic core of the story. Like Soderbergh understands 
understands these people and the choices that they are making and why they have to make those choices. He understands how it will change their lives and why it's important to tell these types of stories within a genre that he's already worked in multiple times. I just like, I can't not talk about how empathetic and wonderful I think that this film is towards Southern identity and the script is great, the direction is great, the performances are great. All around this film works on an empathetic, sympathetic level and I think it's kind of a marvel because nobody does that for Southern Identity. Still, I also love how every woman is styled in this movie because like, man, they're, they're mostly ugly. It's, mo it's mostly bad, but also it's extremely true to life. Like most of the women, especially the important women in this film are dressed like somebody's mom that I grew up with or an older sister. Like Riley Keough's outfits are so bad in the best way because they are so authentically true and Bobby Joe like Katie Holmes in all of her weird outfits absolutely amazing I also love that even though I don't care about NASCAR and I never have the film understands its importance to modern southern culture and that while it's very easy to make fun of NASCAR as a sport it is a huge industry it's really important it's just as important as like fucking football in the south okay like it just is. And it's a huge industry that really gets like put into perspective, like how big of an industry it is in this film. And it's not mean about it, which again, the empathy of this film is just outrageous. I also love this like small, subtle commentary about Southern culture and how it is linked to poverty with the medical RV, which is not in, it's like in two scenes, but they rule. And I love Sylvia so much. Jimmy Logan, you know as well as I do, folks around here don't like the word charity. We West Virginians are proud folk. The RV is less about trying to change people and more about trying to meet people on their levels, especially since, as reported in 2019, at least 16% of people in the state of West Virginia live in abject poverty. And that's the lowest that number has been in 20 years. And to put that into kind of more perspective, the state that reported the most poverty was Mississippi with 19.6% of people in the entire state living in poverty. So it's like, we're not that far down, okay? Like West Virginia is not that far down. We're not that far down. And I think that this film does a really good job of allowing that world to exist without being cruel or mean or judgmental. Those trash bags full of cash can turn everybody's lives around and they do. And with all of that background setting and world building, the film is also remarkably fun and funny. It is a wild ride that has really fun twists and turns and I always die at this particular line, like Channing Tatum's delivery of it is so good. All right, Sadie Mo, get them goggles down. I don't want to get none of senior papers. Also, did I mention how gorgeously shot this film is? Like, Soderbergh killed that. I love everything about it. I also love the music in this film. If it wasn't clear from the fact that I wanted to talk very lightly about John Denver. I love Take Me Home Country Roads. It is one of my favorite, like, good old country songs. It rules. You can blast it. It's great. John Denver is great. He's a musical legend. And I think that of all of the films that featured some version of Take Me Home Country Roads in 2017, which if you'll recall was four different movies, this particular use of Take Me Home Country Roads is, I think, the best. Argue with me about it, I suppose. But I think in terms of themes and feelings and the idea of family and the idea of culture and space and making space within your culture for your family and all of those feelings that are kind of embodied in Take Me Home Country Roads, this is the best use of that song. And like maybe this film kind of just hit me at the right time. Like I had just moved to Los Angeles from North Carolina like less than four months by the time this movie came out and I was missing home, which was also why I wanted to see three billboards. <sighs> and this film could have been completely filled with stereotypes, but it wasn't. Like, it has things that you could say are stereotypes about Southern or Appalachian culture, but I think that it is handled with such truth that it's not making a mockery of anything. It's just trying to be honest. It's weird and it's wonderful and I still get giddy when I think about it. It rules. Logan Lucky fucking rules. This is the best Southern film ever made. Thanks. <laughs>
I don't know if that's true, but it it feels true. It's probably not true, but this movie rules. Anyway, come find me on Twitter or Letterboxd or whatever, and we can talk about the best use of a John Denver song in a 2017 film, or we could talk about whatever you think the best Southern film is. Also, thanks to all my patrons for making this video possible. If you would like to join them, I will leave a link down below. They got to pick this topic, and I love them very much.